very happy to welcome you all to this discussion of feminist publishing and the challenges it faces in India today. We have with us a rather, we have um, in front of us a rather unique session because we are going to be discussing simultaneously feminist publishing in India and feminist and independent filmmaking in India. We have two filmmakers, Uma Tanakke and Anupama Chandra, who made a film on feminist publishing in India. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with the iconic uh, feminist press of India, Kali for Women. Um, the journey of Kali for Women, the journey of feminist publishing, the origins of feminist publishing have now become the subject of a film, the books we made, made by Anupama and Uma. We also have with us today, Urvashi Putalia, co-founder of Kali for Women and founder of Suban Press. So before we get into the discussion. We'll watch a short excerpt of about seven minutes from the film and then begin our discussion. From them. I welcome you all to the session once again. And so they went back, thought about it, and then they came up with this brilliant, ingenious solution of um, you know drawing the woman fully dressed, head to toe, Stop old knee, choli, lenga, everything. And Please then you lift up. Film. Everyone in the village laughed at them and said, this is not a realistic book because you never see a naked woman in a village. So how can you have this book? And so they went back, thought about it, and then they came up with this brilliant, ingenious solution of um, you know drawing the woman fully dressed, head to toe, old knee, choli, lenga, everything. And then you lift up a little flap on the lenga, and you see how she's made. It's genius. Yeah, it's quite clever. No? And all the drawings are by these. Uh... All the drawings are by the village women. And in my head, or in our heads as publishers, you know, there are certain fundas you grow up with. A book is written by one author, two authors, maybe three. Here were 75 authors, say, so we are all authors. Or sabke naam aayenge kitab pe. You know, how do you deal with that? And because you only think, okay, the book has a cover and the cover is the front, you put the name. How are you going to put 75 names on the front cover? So, here are all the 75 authors. We had to put them here. That was one of the conditions of the book. Early 80s was also the start of the anti-dowry campaign. We had a group called Sri Sangharshan. We were very much in the forefront of the anti-dowry campaign, anti-rape campaign. We had a street play. We had a street play. We had a play. with the uh, book production is at the end of the day the quality of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's painful for me right now that this is what's being photographed. I'm dying to go and get a decent print. Yeah, yeah. And which you should. Which you should. Which you should. It's like which you should. <laughs> this quality is miserable and I've long uh, sort of Okay, given the economies of alternative publishing, it's going to be cheap paper. Uh, etc. So one knows that and you're prepared for that. For me there, in, I guess the activist self becomes more predominant and says that the circulation of the image reaching out within the context of these very important historical narratives becomes very important.
June 84. I don't remember the date now, maybe 27th or something. Some date. But actually it had started before we were chatting and talking on the phone and writing and corresponding and talking to people and we actually started working in June. In the garage? In the garage, yeah. You cut a ribbon? No, nothing of the kind. Every single country where feminist publishing began, began with the movement. It came out of the movement. It didn't come out of the mainstream publishing uh, environment at all. It came out of a political context. I, I have to keep saying that, you know, we are in a very different place. We are a small independent publisher. We are still marginal. Now, working from a marginal space is a very, uh, is, is a very, uh, is, is a, what, to use that overworked term, is very empowering. It's very empowering to be in the margins. Why is it empowering? It's empowering because, as I say, you, you, you have nothing to lose. You're already in the margins. What will happen? You'll fall off the margin. Nothing worse can happen. But because you're on the margin, you can take the kind of risk, you can say the kinds of things, you can do the kinds of things that are possible from a marginal space. It's a question of where you see yourself in the world and where you see your activity in the world. In our case, books. But in your case, films. Let's say, you know, we're all in marginal spaces. There's no difference. After all, Mahesh Bhatt is not making a film on me. Oh, I would have Kashyap. There must have been moments where you felt you can't carry on in this way. Every day. Every day. <laughs> not moments, every day. Mm -hmm. You see, in our case, mm -hmm. we're concerned about, say, the next three years, because that's how long it takes for a list to develop. Mm -hmm. The economics of feminist publishing is a very different item. Mm -hmm. Because we're not looking at the annual bottom line. Mm -hmm. We're looking at whether we will be able to continue over the next three or four years without going under or without reducing the list. What do you do if you don't have enough money? You produce less books. You produce less books, you sell less. If you sell less, you're not visible in the market. If you're not visible in the market, authors don't come to you. Do you see how it works? If authors don't come to you, don't have books. If you don't have books, if you don't, have books you don't publish. If you don't publish, you don't exist. you saw only seven minutes and I had the pleasure of watching the whole film and I really enjoyed it and I hope it gets to be seen and discussed by a wider audience as well and all of it, not just seven minutes of it. Um, so I would like to begin this discussion with a, a question, a point for reflection addressed to Urvashi. Um, Urvashi, one of the things that came through pretty powerfully in the film for me when I was watching it and we see some signs of it here as well is where uh, you understand how feminist publishing is by its very nature a collective enterprise. You have 75 women collaborating to make a book. Um, there's also that moment in the film in which Ritu very charmingly says, always two women, it's always two women. Right, when she talks about and you show images of women in publishing. And uh, there's also uh, that very nice clipping of you interacting with your readers in one of the Zuban bookstores in which you're actually inviting your young readers to bring you manuscripts, to do translations of them. So everybody's home or anybody's home could have a story. Anybody could be an author, a translator. Um, I mean, who owns ideas really, right? So it seems like these styles of working and this democratic ethos is what has in a sense inspired Kali for Women and now uh, Zuban and what has powered your vision and Ritu's vision. Uh, but surely there must be tensions when you are located within a publishing industry, a mainstream publishing industry, which responds to very different dynamics. 
so what are the limits of this? What are the possibilities of this? And can you tell us a little more about these tensions? Well, you know, the tensions are the real challenge in many ways. Um, you say feminist publishing is always a collective enterprise, true. And that is because it grows out of the women's movement, which is collective by its very nature in all the discussions and the democratic functioning and so on. But when the collectiveness of street level politics, ground level politics moves into an office space, then it has to take a somewhat different form. So one of the challenges for us as feminist publishers was how to create feminist workspaces which were democratic, uh, but which were also um, where the responsibility ended with those at the top of the hierarchy, which was basically Ritu and me. I mean, we were the bosses, so the buck stopped with us. We took responsibility for everything. But in the decision making, it was actually collective. But more than that, we are talking about women's lives. We are talking about how feminism and the women's movement make the personal and the political overlap the very core of their being which means that the stories have to be sourced from the collective that is around you, which means that the stories can never be the stories only of women like you and me, middle class, privileged, English speaking, and so on, that you always have to look beyond that. And you often are looking at women, like the women in the book you saw in the clip, who are rural women from Rajasthan. You're always looking at women who may have things to say, who may have the words to say them, who may not have the language, who may not have the literacy, who may not have the education to say them. So you're working in a very, very different way. Because somebody may have something wonderful to say, somebody else may have the ability to write it, somebody else may have the ability to produce it. We're all part of a larger political feminist collective enterprise where we recognize our collective contributions. So. That is a very different way of functioning from how the traditional publishing world functions. And in some ways, you have to become a bit genus faced Because as a feminist publisher, that's where your political responsibilities lie. And then to get those voices out into the world, you have to learn to function in the business ethos. And so you learn to do that and you keep that open, which often means that you are you remain at the margins. Ritu says they're empowering. I would not quite use that word. I would say being at the margins is challenging. And I would say that the margins are the center. So the, the enterprise is always to, to shift the center and say, this is us. And this is what it's about. And you better actually listen. I'd like to turn to the two of you, Uma and Anupama, and uh, get your sense of the Janus faced nature of Filmmaking, really, and your position uh, in, a, in a perhaps a very similar way, but in a different world. Um, it was interesting uh, listening to you, Urvashi, because uh, to make the margin the center, uh, before I directed this film, uh, I was an editor for 20 years. And this is the thing about uh, filmmaking. It's extremely hierarchical, which is uh, very anti, for me, the spirit of feminism, uh, the director treated as the most important being on a film, whereas in documentary filmmaking, for example, the editor is practically a co-director. This is seldom acknowledged. This uh, one has experienced over the years. So to hear Urvashi say how there are many parts of a collective whole that make up a book, there's so many parts of a film that make up a film, but is seldom discussed, written about, understood. And for me, this has been quite painful. And uh, this film in particular uh, came out of, uh, I think when I was in school, uh, I, had, uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. And in 1984, Kali started. I was like, oh, that's right, I'll just go and work with <laughs> Kali. And as soon as I graduated, I went with my CV uh, to Urashi for a job. And they said, oh, we're not hiring. And then I'm like, oh, what do I do now? So I went into filmmaking, <laughs> right? But then when the time came to make a first film, the first idea that popped into my head was this one. And a lot of people said, again, this is an example of how people can be very hierarchical when they talk about films. They said, oh, you're making a film about books? How is that? How can you make a film about books? I don't know how many people asked me this question. And I would just get annoyed. I'd say, can you make a film about rabbits? They'd say yes. So I'd say, well, aren't rabbits an object? Yes. So books are an object, and therefore I can make a film about books. But I had to defend this idea 
Whereas in my world, all ideas are open. I mean, you can make a film about anything. But this, this feeling that a book, you can't make a film about books. You can make films that are adapted from books. You can't make a film about a feminist press. It's too boring. What is there to say? Who's going to watch it? Everyone said this. But these ideas were central to my life, to the books I read. Uh, they were absolutely an indispensable part of who I became, these books. So for me, they were much more than, you know, just something that's on a shelf and bought and then read. So yeah, so you have that in films, people telling you what you can do, can't do, and so on. Yeah, just, uh, just taking you from where uh, you said, uh, uh, you are open, so people came to you and said, what, you got to make a film about books. I'm normally uh, very formidable. Nobody comes and asks me, why are you making a film about books? I just inform people that I'm making a film about feminist publishing, and they say, yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> to answer what uh, you had asked, uh, see, uh, most often they're not, uh, uh, I look at my work as two sides. One is to, one is the kind of jobs I take up to pay my rent and my food bills, and the second is the kind of jobs I want to do. And most often they're not the films that I've worked on, there's no money. Uh, uh, and over 20 years, I, I would say 80% of the work I've done has been the latter, not the former. But that 20% has paid my rent for the last 20 years, so which is good. Uh, I think uh, 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 in the first screening I had answered uh, when somebody said, why did you make the, the film about these very books and not other books? But the books chose themselves, is the answer I gave. It was too short and too brief. But I also feel the kind of films we make uh, choose us more than we choosing those films. So, um, there's something once again about the film that struck me as a very powerful core of the film, which is about the how the women's movement in India and feminist publishing in India are inextricably intertwined. So their point of origin is the same. Uh, they owe their existence to a shared political moment in history. So clearly when Kali for Women was born, it was not a neutral enterprise. You were already partisan. You were on the side of those who had been historically silenced. And your mandate, as you saw it clearly, was that of recovering and retrieving those voices, of respecting those voices and making them heard. Um, but when you look at that, that journey period, Urvashi, now, Perhaps now there is a greater, far greater acceptance and accommodation even, even within the mainstream world of voices that are different, of writing by women, for instance, of writing or speaking from the margins, for instance, right? Whereas at the point of time that you began, there was no ready-made market. You created the market. You educated people on what they must also open their hearts and minds to and what they must learn to appreciate. So this movement of both feminist writing and women's writing and women's scholarship, if you like, from the margins to somewhere near the center, if not at the center, over these years. If you look at that movement, uh, what would you say has been gained? What would you say has been lost over this period, this over this process of mainstreaming? Or would you not use the words loss and gain at all? Would you just use different categories to make sense of it? Okay, so there's lots of questions there. Uh, my first response is I think all publishing is um, takes political standpoints, it's, there is no such thing as neutral publishing. But there is a way in which mainstream publishing represents itself as neutral or likes to be seen as neutral and in doing so it uses the fact that it publishes all kinds of things um, so that because we are open to all kinds of voices therefore we are neutral. There is no such equation. The neutrality is an assumption of the majority. That's basically what it is. If you analyze uh, mainstream publishing in India for the last 30, 40 years, uh, all the big houses, you will see a pattern of the kinds of books they publish. And that pattern will show that Dalit voices are missing, that uh, women's voices are missing, that voices from the margins are missing, that the largest number of books are by Hindu writers, the largest number of books are by male writers, mm -hmm. and so on. I don't see that as neutrality. However, what happens is that in the world around us, there seems to be an assumption that the publisher who wears her politics on her sleeve, like us, unashamedly and proudly, is somehow partisan. I don't 
actually agree. People say to us, we are niche publishers. I think it's a load of nonsense. We publish about half the world. But whereas when other publishers published male writers who are also half the world, they're not considered niche. Because the male, the upper class male is the unmarked norm. So I want to disabuse that notion that political publishing or publishing that is honest about its politics is in some way marginal, is in some way partisan. Um, it is, we are all partisan. We are more honestly partisan. I love the partisanship of our publishing. I would not have it any other way. So, so I think that that is one thing. The second thing is that, you know, in the nature of publishing, actually, it is the smaller publishers, the independent publishers, who, as Ritu points out in the film, when she says the margins are empowering because you've got nothing to lose, so you can actually put your politics into action. And because the measure of success for you is not necessarily money, but it's success in the politics of reaching those voices out, so you will go that distance, that more distance, further distance to get those voices out. The mainstream will be very hesitant because they can't see a direct link between publishing those voices and making money. They can't see a market and they don't want to put in the resources to develop that market. They would rather publish for the market that already exists. So they wait for us to do the hard work. And then they step in. So I remember, I mean, I know this sounds terrible to say, and I'm not saying it as a, I'm not whinging or complaining. This is the reality of things. When we started publishing books by women, everybody said, oh, women, do they read? Despite the fact that all statistics in the world show that women now read more than men. Never mind, statistics are something else. But do they read? Will they buy books? Or do they write? What do they write about? The issues are so marginal. The issues are so small because women write about or used to write about so-called, within quotes, personal issues which are seen as not serious enough. But we published, we created the market, and then everybody thought, wow, there's money here. So one of the challenges is that the mainstream with much larger resources moves in to appropriate the kind of knowledge that independent, small, struggling publishers create. And at some point in your life, you recognize this for the reality that you have to live with. And you stop being infuriated by it. And you start realizing that, yes, this is my role. And you continue to do your role with joy and so on. So we face that all the time. But the broader point of that also is what you pointed out, Kalpana, which is that for women writers today, 30 years since Kali was set up, 32 years since Kali was set up, and we are not the only ones. There are other women publishers like Stree and others who are doing books. They, the space for women's writing has opened up, which is great, I think, because this is what it was all about. You know? So women writers are no longer marginal, even though they are still far fewer in number. And there is still a lot to be done. Um, but the space has begun to open up. That raises a question for people like us. That our, is our success our death? Does that mean that we've written ourselves out of history? Does that mean we no longer have a role to play when the alternative starts to become the mainstream? Then does the marginal alternative voice have a role? And we believe that there is a role and there's still a lot to do. But um, it remains to be seen. But even if like tomorrow we find that we are um, sort of now no longer needed, we are redundant, at least we'll have worked damn hard for 30 years to do what we believe in. And that's reward in itself. So in a sense, you have to balance all these things. I mean, I would love it if we were hugely successful in the business world. I would love to give HarperCollins and Penguin a run for their money. But I know that it's not going to happen. It's just a dream. So I can keep on dreaming about it. One day we'll have this blockbuster, which will be feminist which will shake the market and shake the world, and that will be our monetary success. Meanwhile, we publish what we believe in and be happy with it. That's a great response. Thank you so much for those perspectives. Um, coming back to the question of what is it that you are doing, really, um, and watching the film also, something that struck me is uh, something the feminist historian Joan Scott says, that. One part of the work is writing women into history, but the story doesn't end there. It's not just a stir women ad and stir women into the cauldron. It's also writing a new history. It's also providing a new lens by which to look at conventional or established truths. 
And some of your books seem to speak to that with a great deal of urgency. I'm talking, for instance, about the book that was also featured in the film, Shahi Nakhtar's Search, which is on the women victims of violence of the Bangladesh War of Independence of 1971. The women who were interned within the Pakistani army camps and then who were subjected to severe sexual torture and violence and the book that grew out of that experience. I think what that book does is not just to foreground the voices and experiences of women in pain, but also give us a new lens by which to look at history. Then what does victory mean? Right? Who can be martyrs? Whose martyrdom is acknowledged and whose martyrdom is completely erased from the pages of history? Um, so, and likewise, I think your work on Kashmir, you have the book, uh, the photographic essay uh, of journal, uh, Women Speaking Peace in Kashmir, and then you have your most recent book on Konan Poshpara. Certain books, I'm guessing, will probably have a more difficult journey because of how fraught the climate is, how, in a sense, vitiated the political climate is. But feminist publishing means getting those books and those voices out there and in our faces. So perhaps you can also tell us a little bit about whether the reception of these books has been different and the way in which they have acted on the world has meant also difficult times for you and more challenging times for you as a publisher. Yeah, both difficult and rewarding. So, um, for example, we published a book a while ago, which is uh, the autobiography of a domestic worker, Baby Haldar. It's her life story. And um, it opened the way for us to publish books about the lives of marginalized women. And that kind of became um, a stream in publishing where you see more and more of that. Baby is a poor woman. She's a woman who works in the house, does the washing and the swabbing and the cleaning and the cooking and all of that. And led a really hard life like millions of Indian women, poor Indian women. And then she found a job in Delhi with a professor who noticed her as a human being noticed the attention she paid to books, encouraged her to read, and helped her to write. And she wrote this autobiography, which is today translated into 23 languages, and which actually has been the book that has earned Zuban the most money we ever earned from one single book, which to me is really an important reversal, that it's the poor woman's story that actually helps to economically lift up a, a publishing house. So there are stories like that, uh, which are political and Mm, which are really necessary to publish and one of them, the, the Kashmir books are an example of that. So when we started looking around at the books that were published, we saw that the history of Kashmir has some 150 books on it. Nothing about women, zero. And it's so clear from all the writings and the activism, the way in which women in Kashmir are being impacted by the conflict since the 90s. So we put together a book of essays, which has Shiva's photo essay, rather wonderful photo essay, which she did in Kashmir. And then subsequently, we have continued to publish on Kashmir. And it's interesting because it's not only the content of the books, it's also the process of making them. So the first book had essays by women in Kashmir and outside of it who wrote about Kashmir. This particular one, do you remember Konan Poshpora? This book has such an interesting history. There are five young women lawyers in Kashmir, all in their 20s. When they were watching what had happened in Delhi in the aftermath of the December 2012 rape case, which hit all the national headlines, they started asking themselves this question, saying if one rape case in the capital of the country can raise a nationwide protest, why doesn't the same kind of noise get made about our backyard where it's happening every day? And they started looking at their history and they were hardly born at the time that the 1991 Kunan Poshpora mass rape by the army took place in these two villages, Kunan and Poshpora. And one of them asked the other one the question, do you remember Kunan Poshpora? And she said, what was that? And they started exploring their own history. And then they filed a case for the reopening of the case which was being tried in the army court. Now, why should a rape case be tried in the army court? Because even though the Armed Forces Special Powers Act gives the army extraordinary powers to do things in the cause of duty, how can you ever rape in the cause of duty? So why should an army rape not be tried under the normal law of the land? But it had been tried in the army court, and then it had been allowed to languish. And these girls then decided that they would file a petition to reopen the case. And they put the army into panic. They filed the petition. It's, being, it's still in the courts. 
they decided then to write a book and then they didn't know how to write a book. So this is how feminist publishing works. They got in touch with us and they said, we don't know how to write the book, we've got the story. Can you teach us? So we invited them to Delhi, we did a two-day workshop with them, structured the chapters of the book, etc. And then they went back and wrote this book, which now has become the book that asks questions about this rape case, and maybe, we hope, instrumental in getting justice, some form of justice, 25 years on for the survivors, some of whom are still around. The Bangladesh book, we are really interested in the strong connections between the feminist movement in South Asia. And we did this rather wonderful novel about the Bangladesh war, which I'll ask Anupama and Uma to tell you about, because they traveled to Bangladesh, met the writer. But it's a novel that opens up the whole question of what happened to the Birongona, the raped woman, during the war, and was it only the Pakistani army that was responsible, or was it the Mukti Jodas also? who sexually exploited the women and how did relationships form across this wartime enmity and sometimes the most empathetic relationships formed across Pakistan and Bangladesh, you know, with the army and the women and so on. And it's an amazing voice coming out of there. So we published that in English. Yeah. But, it, you know, being small publishers, these books do not go as far as they should. I think they're really raising fundamental questions, but they remain limited because of our limited powers of distribution and so on. But why don't you talk about that? Okay, uh, the book uh, Urvashi is mentioning is uh, one called The Search, Talash in Bangla, by Shaheen Akhtar. Uh, as often happens with feminist books, uh, as Urvashi said, they don't get distributed. And this book uh, was presented to me by a friend. And I put it on a bookshelf and forgot about it. I didn't open it. And then one day when I was dusting uh, the books, it fell open on a page. And the page was this, Miriam, who's our central character. Uh, an old college friend of hers, they're in a courtyard. Uh, he waves to her. It's the middle of the war. They're both prisoners. He's just being brought into this concentration camp. He waves to her. She's standing at the window, and she's about to wave back. And then she suddenly retreats from the window because she realizes she's wearing only her underwear. And I was like, God, what is this book? And I began reading it. I, of course, knew about the Bangladesh war. And in Against Our Will, uh, Susan Brown Miller has calculated that some 400,000 women, approximately, were attacked by the Pakistani army. That figure is disputed, but this is the figure that she arrived at. I read that book. And other than, uh, of course, in some way, uh, making real the scale of what happened, What's interesting is the central character, Miriam. She is a survivor in the true sense. I mean, what happens to her is extremely brutal. But at no stage does Miriam give up. She goes through many stages of Bangladeshi history, and that's what is interesting about the book. It isn't just about 71. It's also about what happens afterwards. And it's uh, the book creates itself in tiny details, like Miriam's broken sandal strap in the middle of a political de demonstration. The fancy blouse Miriam wears after the war to go and get a job from her old boyfriend who abandoned her in the middle of the war. This is what really makes the book. This is women's writing. The stuff that is considered too trivial, too unimportant, the same material in the hands of a man, of course, I, I doubt that, I don't know whether the subject has been approached by a man, but it, it might have been on a grander, more heroic scale, but this in fact is even a funny book. There are moments where you just laugh out loud. How can you laugh? And some of the moments when you laugh, for example, a woman is killed during a gang rape. On the very next page, there's a joke in which you just have to laugh. And, and it has this strange effect, this book. It's very, very dark humor, but that Shaheen could find it in herself. To, to find humor in this, to, to, not, to not create the figure of the tragic rape victim is, for me, uh, true feminist writing. And, and this is what these books do. So when we read it, we were so affected, we had to go to Bangladesh. We had to meet her and uh, find out how this book was made. And then, of course, the hardest thing was to film something like that, uh, to try and create a visual correlate to the book. Because certain challenges come in filmmaking that are also feminist challenges. Uh, uh, the representation of a raped person, and there are many representations in Bangladesh. There's a war museum where there are many, many photographs 
of women who were raped, murdered, and these murders were in fact documented. So these were decisions on the edit table, uh, what to bring in, what to leave out, uh, obscene graffiti by Pakistani soldiers, do we put that in, do we leave that out, is it, is it voyeuristic, is it not voyeuristic? These are intense decisions that we make as we make these films. And to talk a little more about what Urvashi was saying earlier, the marginal in film and the mainstream in film. Uh, in the mainstream film, again, there is some kind of acceptance of objectivity. I, I refer, of course, to mainstream Indian cinema of some kind. I mean, of course, it's highly stylized. But, but it is stylized in a way that people send in question. In the work that we do, there is a constant battle with the image. The image is not meant to not be questioned. And, and by attacking the image, especially during the edit, we hope to arrive at, a, at something bigger than perhaps what was there even when we were filming. So what happens to the films that we make? What happens to the books that Urvashi makes? Firstly, a lot of people don't believe that we make films at all. They say, are you a filmmaker? Yes. What do you do? Documentaries. Oh, I thought you said you made films. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I never have a response to that. I don't even know where to begin. And then feminist ones. Worse, worse, <laughs> much worse. Much worse. But the state of the documentary in India, uh, there are so many brilliant Indian documentary filmmakers, and the only word to describe them is brilliant. You will see their films only in festivals, but I feel uh, this is where the real work of Indian cinema is being done. Uh, if you look at the people who are considered artists and auteurs in Bollywood, for example, uh, Devakar Banerjee, Vishal Bhardwaj, uh, if you were to speak to them, they might tell you how many cues they've taken from documentary. Uh, Devakar Banerjee, for example, has been greatly influenced by documentary in his visual style. And so as feminist filmmakers, we know this, and we are working without money, about 90% of the time, without any reward in terms of viewership. Uh, yet we do it because it's the only work that is truly interesting. So as Urvashi said, that if after 30 years you have a sense, we've been in it for 20 years, if after 30 years you have a sense <laughs> of joy, that, okay, well, joy is not the word, but it's just like I couldn't have done anything else. I couldn't have sat in an edit room and edited a Bollywood black blockbuster. I would have forgotten that the next year. But the films that we work on, uh, I remember the rushes of films I edited 20 years ago. I will never forget them. So documentary filmmaking is where the real stories of this country are being told. And in mainstream filmmakers, uh, you find a lot of uh, covering up of the real stories. That's, that's the thing. What is there to add? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, one small thing uh, to talk about marginals. Uh, earlier, we were looking at women. Uh, we were uh, trying to tell their stories. Now, the, the circle has become bigger. We have included, we have become more inclusive. Uh, that also is feminism, you know. Uh, so, uh, the films that we make talk about inclusiveness, the documentary films, more than the commercial films. Um, so I guess one last question and then we should open up to the audience for your uh, questions and your interaction uh, with uh, the three people here on the stage. One question that I have and of course we've already talked about that is the point where I think very eloquently and movingly you say in the film that at the end of the day it's your responsibility to make sure that the people working in Zuban have their salary paid by the end of the month and it's your, the buck sort of stops with you. The challenges of staying viable, of staying afloat uh, today uh, in, in the world of publishing uh, and the challenges of, of making your films and, and having them viewed, having your books read, having your books distributed, having your, do, doing justice to your authors and to the subjects of your film in the, in the context, in the economies of filmmaking and the economies of book publishing there are today. So if you could uh, sort of reflect on that, you already have, but yeah. certainly. <laughs> the economies of filmmaking, yes. Uh, the economies of filmmaking are very the similar. The joys of being on the margins. Really? Okay. 
The economies of filmmaking are very simple. Uh, if you're lucky, you have an idea which is really good. Okay, most of the time you don't have an idea. You're like, I need an idea, I need an idea, and you never have one. Suddenly you have something. Then you have to shop around for funding. Uh, there is, there are a couple of funding bodies in India, and the funds are very, very small. So suppose you get funds. Then it's like, okay, which friend can I now corner to shoot this for almost nothing? You know, that's how it works. But it is a very, very collective enterprise. We all know each other, sometimes in good ways, not very good ways, but we have supported each other over the years. Uh, I have edited many films for nothing, and I have been, again, in this film, my cameraman just shot, <coughs> shot it for nothing. We all worked for nothing, so it does come back. Given that, this is not the future. We, we cannot carry on in this way. We do from year to year, from year to year, we carry on. <laughs> But there has to be more funding. But nobody wants to fund a documentary film, and I don't know why that is, because if I was a funder, that's the only kind of film I would fund. Now, in Canada, Justin Trudeau announced a huge new Canadian filmmaking fund last year, and he put this caveat that it's a massive fund, that 50% of these funds have to be given to female filmmakers. That's it. You know, now, you may Let's you know, get him to India. We should <laughs> send Mr. Modi to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that. He's so good. No, he is. He is. He's very serious. So, so that's the thing. You know, we don't have even NFTC shut down. Everyone remembers the parallel cinema of the 70s and the early 80s. That was because of very, very enlightened and intelligent government uh, funding policies. But we as audiences today, this is depressing, tend to judge a film by its monetary success. What does that even mean when I read in the newspaper, such and such film grows 300 crores on the opening weekend. Oh, well, I mean, does that mean it's a good film? Or does that mean that they had a lot of sales on popcorn and coke? Because that's, in fact, where the money gets made in, in mainstream films. So I guess in the end, you need people, people who have money, to be willing to support intelligent, interesting enterprises that once you begin to engage with, you really can't stop. If you start reading books by Zuban, Kali for Women, Women Unlimited, the feminist press, there's a wonderful web page out there called neglectedbooks.com. Just go onto it and you will be ordering books all year, you know. So once you start engaging with this material, it is very, very rewarding, but nobody seems to want to engage and I don't know why. I, I honestly don't know. I'll just add briefly that there are many challenges to survival uh, for the small independent uh, publisher. Um, making money is obviously the big challenge, but fortunately for many of us, this success doesn't mean money, it's the satisfaction in our jobs, but that's not the case with the people who work with us. So then you have to work in this increasingly hostile marketplace where there's increasingly less space, if one can use the word, for the kind of books that we publish. And you have to think on your feet to find new ways of selling them. I'm still convinced that there is a market out there. I'm still convinced that there is interest out there. Uh, books are not that expensive, so people can buy them, even though there's strong resistance to price rises uh, in books, which there isn't to hamburgers and other things. Um, but it is something that, you know, the, the channels of distribution and all of that are really difficult. So, in a sense, you're forced to do other things like we do projects uh, to do with the women's movement, etc., which get in a bit of money, which can help to pay the salaries, which can help to keep the publishing going. That is the reality of the thing, and that is the way you have to function. Um, but, you know, there is a way in which the partnership between different kinds of feminist, um, feminists working in different areas is really important. So, for example, when Oma and Anupama thought of making a film on us, we were far more delighted with that, then we would have been with any BBC producer or somebody else wanting to come and make a film because this is what it means to us. This is what feminism is all about. But let's see if people have questions. Okay, so we spoke about feminism with respect to books and movies and how they may have a limited viewership and readership. So there's an other avenue, like the online avenue, which has opened up recently. And so what are, what is your take on the kind of uh, you know, publicizing that, that kind of publicity that that garners and how that has shaped Indian feminism to be precise. Uh, okay, uh, my question is, um, is how to actually propagate the right idea of feminism, like when you actually identify yourself as a feminist, 
um, you know, sometime in college, people label you on a large scale, and then that's it's kind of crazy how they go to. I mean, like it's the extent that they go to to label you. But um, I do think there's a lot of uh, wrong notion going around. There are people who say they are feminists, but they still say don't go out, like in relation to the Bangalore, um, you know, December 31st issue. Like people say, don't go out. You know, it's scary out there, so why bother? So that's not real feminism. So how do you think? You can actually propagate the white right notion of feminism through um, something like you do, like through films. Um, yeah. First of all, when people tell you that feminists burnt bras, don't believe them. <laughs> They're lying because it's too expensive a thing to burn. <laughs> and you know, maybe a hundred years ago, one woman burnt one bra, which she probably made at home, and that's become. <laughs> the icons, so don't believe them. Um, secondly, I mean, I'll leave Umay and Anupama to answer that question, but also I do think that, um, you know, being a feminist is, you don't wear horns or anything like that. Often people tell me you don't look like a feminist and I wonder what I should be looking at to look like a feminist. But it is to be aware that what you are thinking and doing is something that is questioning the very structures of the society you live in. But it's very complicated because you're dealing with people you care for and people you love. So you have to balance those two. And I think you have to strongly believe in what you are and what you, um, what feminism means for you to follow it through in the best possible way. Somebody telling women to stay inside the homes so that they won't get attacked, Really speaking, you should be asking them why they don't tell the men not to go out, because the men are doing the attacking, the women are the ones who are getting attacked. I mean, in answer to your question, you know, it's interesting, the feminine, the publishing world today is filled with women, and it's the women who are controlling the content. And I would say at least 60 to 70 percent of these women may not have come out of the women's movement, but have been strongly enough influenced by feminism to believe in its intrinsic values. They try to put that in practice as much as they can within the corporate frame. It's not easy, but they're fighting in there as much as they can. And I think, I really think it's wonderful. You know, I've, I want to go and put my arms around all the Kartikas and the Chikis and the you know various people who are working in publishing and actually trying to make a difference. So I think you need all kinds of inputs to do that. Uh, there was a third question, but I don't Hmm? Oh, online. So I think we're all working online as much as we can. We're all faced with this dilemma that the online presence is really, really important to reach out. It requires a lot of inputs, but it doesn't pay you back in money. And we're facing this thing of the print sales falling, online sales not rising enough to make up that gap. And so the, that situation is very difficult for the small publisher. When you're backed by big resources, you can ride that till there is parity. But for us, therefore, the online is a space to promote, but not yet a space to sell as much as we would like to. As far as filmmaking is concerned, see, uh, we get a grant from someone to make a film that takes care of your uh, shooting and some, to some extent the editing part. Uh, the directors don't really get much unless of course you know you, you you don't pay your crew enough then you get to make something like the film that we made we worked for two years uh, it, it's a long time you know two years and uh, Anupama stays uh, with her parents so do I and we are living off our parents pensions uh, thanks to them this film got made so they have been thanked first in the film uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know we know for sure this we are not going to make any money from this film. How do, how do I monetize it? There's no way I can monetize it. Uh, the rights are with uh, the funder. So they will sell and they may give a little royalty. But what we really want to do with this film, which is what a publisher also would want, is the film to reach people. Uh, we can't put it online right now. We have to wait for two years, after which this film will be made online and everybody can watch. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite difficult. We can't, we can't put it online. So there's no online uh, availability of these films till the time producer says, okay, now it's available for everyone to watch. Monetization too, just forget it. There's just, uh, yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. The funder, whoever finances 
what was his her, her objective in doing this project and what is the larger goal? Would it meet your goals? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this. Uh, there are very few funders in our country who would uh, uh, fund a film uh, on this topic. Yeah, I mean, the money they gave us uh, helped us to shoot, go to Bangladesh, shoot, meet Shahid, uh, you know, shoot uh, in that place and come back and edit it. It's another matter that the editor and the editor, which is Anupama, uh, she didn't get paid anything. Not it. as directors, we got paid anything. Uh, but we got to make this film, we got to meet fantastic people, we got to read so many wonderful books. And uh, no, the, My question is that uh, would not a founder who was interested in financing something like this even without you know, knowing, knowing very well that it won't have a very big market and they're doing it purely out of a passion maybe that you know, this should come out, would they not also want to meet that part of the budget, you know, the director and the editor's budget? There's no money. They have a limit. They cannot really go See, filmmaking costs a lot of money. A lot. I don't think we can actually imagine it. Uh, a low budget five minute film is can be three lakhs. You know, uh, a low budget, very low budget Bollywood film, you're looking at three crores. Okay? So, who's going to make this kind of money available? <coughs> Uh, they are very few people. Given that the people who funded us, PSBT, uh, one of the oldest uh, funding bodies in this country for documentary, have done a solid job over the years. Uh, and most of our very good documentary filmmakers started out with PSBT funding. So long may PSBT last. Their funds are, are limited, but, it, but you can still at least make some kind of a film on, on these funds. Just one more question. Yeah. Is there any scope for CSR? Just a uh, short question. Uh, do you think that men are not capable of doing justice to the feminist voice? <laughs> well, I can I can agree and I can also disagree. Uh, there are several men who have fantastic uh, feminist voices. Uh, they're very interesting to read. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, and there's several men who don't, but I don't think this is a gendered issue. Uh, you can also ask the same question of almost any gender, that do you or do you not have a feminist voice, because feminism is, does not belong to any one gender. Uh, if feminism is, for me it's a way of life, and this way of life is learnt. So uh, I would like to respond to the person who said, is there a right way to communicate feminism? There is no right way. It's a process. You start off being one kind of feminist, the next year you're another kind of feminist. Ten years later you look back and say, what was I thinking? I didn't know anything. It, it goes on. So it's a process. There's no right, there's no wrong. Feminist ideas have changed immensely over the last 200 years. And some ideas that were radical 200 years ago are still radical today. So th there is no linearity and there is no hierarchy in, in feminism, which is what I like about it. And there is no gender. Anyone can be a feminist. And there are many fine uh, male writers and filmmakers whose films are wonderful to watch. I mean, I'm, I'm just watching Steven Soderbergh. He's, he's a bit complicated. But, but he's, he's got a, a very feminist uh, lens. The feminist lens, we can talk about that at another time. How do you frame a woman? Anyway. So. Uh, if I may just add to that, I think um, Anupama is right in the sense that Feminism is an inclusive ideology and it's uh, nothing that, I mean, we as feminists don't come self-prepared with all the answers. We learn as we go along and as we cut our political teeth more and more, you learn. And if you look at the feminist movement in India, let's say 20, 25 years back, you will see that there was a sense in which we, those of us who were activists then, wanted to exclude men because we wanted to have the confidence to speak out in spaces where our voices could be heard and our voices could be heard in a safe environment that you wouldn't have men taking over as they were accustomed to doing. Today feminism is much more open to the entry of men and in fact if anyone has been raising voices against sexual violence against men and transgenders it's been the feminist movement. So there is a way in which there it is inclusive but there's also a way in which we constantly battle our invisibility in the eyes of even the most sensitive men. 
I want to tell you a quick story about a group of independent web publishers that was set up in Delhi. Ten of us, five women, five men. It wasn't intended, it just happened like that. At our very first meeting, the five women came together and we came early and we were waiting for our male colleagues to come. And the first of them, a fairly sensitive guy we've known all our lives, comes, flings open the door and says, oh, there's nobody here. Because <laughs> he didn't even see us. And we are all like that dreadful word, CEOs. We are all CEOs of our companies, even if our companies are this small. We've all had 30 year careers in publishing. Cumulatively, we had 150 years of experience behind us. The fellow didn't even see us. So, you know, when we are asked to make space for them, I think that enough already. You know, we've created our spaces, let us have them. We're almost out of time here, and there's somebody feels terrible that there's one thing you want to say and you've been denied the opportunity to speak. A man, a man. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's got to be a man, says Urvashi. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we are immensely thankful to all of you. Many of you have been standing and listening to this session. And uh, we had a wonderful participation from the audience. Thank you so much. We were so happy to have you back.